Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cade Mosley, and this is Foreign Legal Materials 1 for the spring term. Uh, as, as you all know, we're not having a regular schedule this term. Uh, we've been asked to do lectures via video that I will upload to YouTube uh, on our Hopi site. And um, so let me first uh, introduce myself. I'm an um, American lawyer. Uh, I work at a NGO here in Tokyo called Human Rights Now that does uh, human rights law. And this course is generally focused on international human rights law, uh, under international law. Um, <clears throat> I'll go in more detail. Um, now let me introduce the class a little. There are three documents that uh, it would be good for you to open for this lecture uh, that you can find on the Hopi site. Uh, uh, there's a folder for the site and within the folder, uh, there's a folder for the class and inside the folder are uh, files that I will upload over time, uh, including the slides for each class. <clears throat> so the three files that would be good to open for this class are the, um, the slides for this class, which are, uh, it starts the number one intro to international human rights law. Uh, then the second thing is the syllabus, FLM syllabus, spring 2020 new. And then the third thing that would be good to just have open and off to the side is called IHRL Fundamentals 2020. IHRL stands for International Human Rights Law. Uh, so the first thing is let's go over the class and let's do that by looking at the syllabus. <coughs> So this is a, um, a lecture-based class. This was also originally designed to be a discussion-based class. Uh, if we were in the classroom, I like to conduct it what we call Socratic style, which is we'll, we go around the room and everybody gets to um, discuss different issues uh, as we go through the materials. That's going to be harder in this current format. So I'm going to think about uh, maybe putting on discussions on the Hopi site, since they have a kind of a forum uh, function on the site, uh, about putting discussion questions on there that you can talk. And the way I'm thinking about, uh, well, I'll get that to, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but practically speaking, for the lectures, what I think I will do is. <clears throat> As I'm doing lectures, I'll bring up the questions that I would normally ask in the class, and um, it really helps for you to think actively as we're going through the materials and not just passively listening to what I'm saying, but actually trying to think about uh, how certain issues would be addressed. If you do that actively, that will help you uh, get the material a lot easier. So the way I want to do that is when we're going as I'm going through the uh, slides, I want to ask questions or bring up points. Why don't uh, think about, you know, how would this happen? Or, uh, you know, how would this case work in this situation? And in those situations, uh, what would be really great is if you watching would actually think about the answer uh, before I just go on to explain it. And in some cases, you can even stop the video and think about what would my answer be to this question and then you can play it and then I can explain, you know, how I think about it. Um, <clears throat> and I think that would be a really, uh, that would be one way you can get some of the value of the discussion element is if you think about answering questions before I just answer them for you and even stopping the video sometimes and thinking about certain things. So in those moments, I'll actually even try to say, um, let me ask a question. What do you think about X or what, you know, how should, X or Y or Z work. All right, <clears throat> so looking at the um, syllabus, uh, we've had a reduced schedule. So um, there's 12 classes instead of 14. Uh, so the last two classes I combined into one, so that 12 classes uh, combined into one. And we'd normally have a writing practice, uh, a, pra a class just focused on writing. And now I'm going to integrate that into the 10th class. Um, I'll just put a little extra part about writing practice. Um, and what I mean by writing practice has to do with this, the main requirement for the class, which is writing two case notes. So uh, 
let me talk about how the assignments will work. Um, there'll be one case note at the end that will happen over the exam period where I will give you uh, a set of questions. I'll give you a case, which is a fact pattern. Uh, it's, it's a description of a, of, a, of, a, of a case, some fact pattern, something that happened in the world. It's a kind of like little story. And uh, the task is you'll write a case report about it. You'll say what the issue is. You know, you'll think about it like a lawyer would think when a client comes in and tells you a story. What's the claims? What kind of claims do they have? What can you take to a court? Um, and then uh, what would you argue for your client's side? You know what? Or if you were the judge hearing a story, what are the legal claims and what should be the outcome? So this is a case note. And um, I'll either, I think I'll try to send, give you, uh, send it out around July 7th and it will be due one week after the final class on July 21st. So that's the main case note. And uh, what I've learned from past experience is students uh, get confused about how to write these. So in this class, I'm going to add a practice case note. Uh, so for the practice one, um, the idea is uh, during the session in which I talk about how to write a case note, um, I'll actually start it with you and we'll write it together in the class and then you can finish it off. <clears throat> uh, so that would be June 30th, the 10th class. And then that would be, if you look on the syllabus, you can see an 11th class, um, July 10th. So that would be the, um, that would give you 10 days, about a week and a half to turn in the practice case note. Um, so it's only practice. You're graded for turning something in. Um, and then I will give you back comments about how, you know, where you need to improve so that you can use those comments to write the final case note. And the final case note is going to be graded on the content itself. So, uh, the early, you know, so if you turn in a, the, so the comments you get from the practice case note are going to help you know how to write the final case note. Uh, I think that's clear. And, and then as for discussion, so I'm thinking about having class discussions over the Hopi site, but I'm not sure how exactly it would work. It's something uh, I'll test out and I'll think more about. And you can also maybe give your input on the Hopi forums as well. So my thinking now is uh, I might put discussion questions on the Hopi site that you can respond to. And my thinking about the best way to do that is if you, uh, in terms of the grade, is if you worry about the um, your grade for the case notes, um, contributing to the discussions on the forum will boost your grade. Uh, but if it's very difficult for you to participate in the, the discussions on that forum, uh, I don't think it should hurt. I don't, I don't think it should hurt your grade, but I encourage everyone to, uh, join the discussions, uh, on the Hopi site. And I'm thinking about, it'll be a kind of extra grade boost. The more you discuss on that, and that would just be participation based. It's not, um, you don't have to worry about always getting the answer right, but um, discussion is, the, the original class, The uh, it's um, participation based. So it's just getting involved in discussions and uh, trying to follow along. <clears throat> All right. So you can look at the, um, as you're looking at the syllabus, uh, you can see the 12 sessions. It's basically walking through the different topics in international human rights law. And uh, if you know, if you uh, looked at the, uh, the, the um, admissions for this class, uh, this class is actually designed to be a two semester course. So if you take it also in the fall course, then we're going to walk through uh, additional human rights issues in the fall course. So the, the spring and fall course are connected in that everything that you learn in this course will be of value. And then we'll be looking at additional topics. So if you take the entire year long course, you'll have an overview over all of international human rights law, which is really valuable to have. Um, and they're kind of thematic between the spring semester and the fall semester. 
Um, they, they have a similar structure and that we'll be writing case notes for that uh, semester as well. Uh, but it's in terms of the themes of the class, this, this term, the spring term, is a little bit more focused on vulnerable populations. So you can look on the syllabus, you'll see topics like women's rights, um, LGBT rights, disability rights, children's rights. Um, these are vulnerable populations. And um, we have a general body of uh, international human rights law that applies to everybody. But particular rules will apply especially for vulnerable populations because they have special vulnerabilities that, you know, we want the law to take care of. Uh, you know, like women's rights or disabled people. Whereas the fall, the fall term is a little bit more oriented towards things like um, conflict and human rights. So things like displaced populations, when you have uh, war and conflicts, um, and then also focused on things like accountability um, and things like uh, the idea, um, you know, can you use, if a state is not performing its human rights obligations, can another state interfere in that state? And even something as serious as right to protect, uh, where a state might want to use force to stop another state from committing massive human rights violations. Those are really um, hot top, those are really complicated topics uh, in international law generally. So those are the kind of topics we'll look at in the fall term. Um, and then the other part, we're, we're looking at vulnerable populations this term. We're also looking at just a general introduction. So you see these first two courses today and tomorrow are going to just introduce international human rights law and the international human rights law system uh, in international governance, including the United Nations, um, generally, just how the system works uh, in these first two classes. And then the next two classes are kind of the core body of international human rights law, which are typically divided into two categories of rights that you're going to learn a lot about in this term, which is civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. And we'll have a class for each one of those. Uh, these two, uh, there's a lot of reasons why they're divided into two separate groups that we'll look at, but um, you implement them a little differently. The way these kind of human rights work, each category of human rights works in practice is a little different. And so that's why we're having a class specifically for each one. Um, and then we're going to walk through, like I said, some vulnerable populations like women's rights and human trafficking, which includes sex and labor trafficking, um, LGBT rights and disability and children's rights. Uh, but along with, while we're looking at those topics, you'll notice also we're going to look at some specific uh, civil and we're going to look at specific categories of rights too. So not only LGBT rights, but we'll also look at the right to privacy which is a human right in itself that relates very close, you know, LGBT rights uh, is very related to the right to privacy. So we're going to also learn the right to privacy in that context. And when we look at disabled rights, we're also going to look at the right to health generally. Uh, and then when we look at children's rights, we're going to look at also the right to education and family, which are really very often related to children's rights. So we're going to look at some of these categories of human rights together. And then, uh, and then, the next two or th the next three classes um, are kind of a more in also still in the kind of introductory um, core human rights. So we're going to look at uh, fair trial and penal rights. Um, penal just means uh, when someone uh, based on criminal law. So when someone is brought to trial for a criminal case, uh, we call these penal rights. Um, or if they're incarcerated, if they go to prison, they have to be treated a certain way you know, in the trial, and also fair trial standards like witnesses, and um, we'll talk more about that. And then uh, freedom of expression, which is a core human right. Uh, and then freedom of expression, freedom of speech is also often connected to assembly, freedom of assembly and association. So we'll look at that human right. And then the final class is, um, isn't a specific category of human rights per se. It's a, it's a kind of recent development and application of human rights. So this has to do with the uh, civil society and especially the internet. So uh, this is how human rights typically applies in our contemporary world. Um, so one is there's a, uh, international human rights has developed over time. 
um, from the origins it had in the post-war period in the 1940s uh, and 50s as they developed these original uh, core human rights issues. Um, in the contemporary world, there's a large, in the original period, the biggest contribution was coming from states. Uh, state governments were the ones implementing human rights. Uh, the biggest development in more recent years is the role of civil society, which are things like uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, private groups that aren't uh, that are not governmental organizations. Uh, so the role of human rights experts in civil society, um, nonprofit groups, uh, also corporations. Uh, are starting to turn out to be actors uh, that uh, are involved in human rights issues. And then the other biggest development that we want to talk about is with internet and human rights. So the online world has uh, really transformed uh, how civil society and how, uh, you know, public discourse works, and that includes for human rights issues. So the internet and online world can be a source of both uh, addressing human rights problems, but they can also uh, help cause and facilitate human rights problems. Uh, so that's the kind of overview of all the different classes. And then, like I said, the, the two major obligation, the two major um, assignments for the class are the two case notes, the practice case note and the final case note. The practice case note I would um, hand out probably in the 10th class. Uh, to be due 10 days, I think 11 days later on July 10th. So it gives you just about two weeks. And then I'm thinking about giving the final um, final case note questions to you around July 7th. So you also have about two weeks. Uh, and that will be due exactly one week after the final class, so July 21st, uh, and by 6 p.m. All right. So that's kind of an overview of the syllabus. Before we look uh, at the slides, let's look at the IHRL fundamentals. So this PDF, so this, uh, as you look at the top heading, International Human Rights Law Basic Info. So this has uh, a, a lot of this information, actually, we're going to talk about in this class because it's the introduction. <clears throat> so... This is these two page, this two page PDF is basically an overview of all of international human rights law, kind of at your fingertips. It's a kind of like a cheat sheet. Um, it has all the basic information all compacted into one very small form. So as we're looking at a lot of different human rights issues, um, I think it's a good idea to always have this sheet off to the side because I'm going to refer to it a lot. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of situations where multiple human rights uh, issues will come up in the same situation. And then I can ask, you know, in this kind of situation, what human rights uh, issues do you think might come up? And it's really great to have this because, you know, you can just look on the front page. You can see a list of the core human rights uh, directly on this page. You know, no arbitrary arrest, freedom of movement, right to fair trial under the ICCPR. This is just a direct list. So if you're thinking about what human rights issues might apply, it's good to have this off to the side to look at. And this also, you know, gives the big division between civil and political rights and economic and social rights, which we'll talk more about. Um, and then that's this major box. Um, you see there's three major boxes at the top, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the ICCPR and ICESCR. This is the core body of human rights law. Um, so this is an overview of those documents right here. And you see in the bottom right of that big box is other human rights treaties. Um, and then below that are a lot of international human rights law principles that we're going to go over in this introduction. So just keep this uh, at the side and I'll refer to a, a lot in future cases, in future classes. All right. So I think that's a good overview of the course and the assignments and where the grade comes from. Um, I'm going to send out slides. I'm going to try to send out the slides for each class at least a week in advance. So the Tuesday before a class is assigned, uh, I'll put the slides up. <clears throat> 
and then I'll try to have the lecture up by the date of before the date of the assigned date on the syllabus. Um, so it's a good idea before you watch the lecture to read the slides, to just go over the slides, even if you, you know, briefly just kind of skim over them. But the more you read it, the more you're going to get out of the lectures. So that's why I will give the slides at least a week in advance. And if you look on the files on the class, you'll see that I already have the slides for the first two classes. I have the slides for this class, the introduction. And then you can see two, um, it's the, um, the slides for international, uh, the, the international system. So, and that's called two international human rights system slides. Uh, so the slides are normally going to have numbers one, two, three, and four in front of it. So the first lecture is going to be one. The second class will be, have a two in front of it. And uh, for many topics, I also want to have a, a reading, like a very short reading, maybe only like two pages or so. Um, that will kind of show you how this law works in practice. So because we're going to, in this class, we're going to go over a lot of just the core rules about how international human rights law works, uh, but how something, uh, how the law is actually written down on paper can be different from how it's actually implemented once you give it to government officials to actually imp implement the law. So for a lot of, so as soon as we get to the more substantive classes, I'm also going to start put reading start to put readings up and you'll always know what's assigned for a class what's special to a class because of that number up front so for the third class for women's right if i put an article up for women's rights you'll see there'll be three the um you'll, there'll be a three up front so for the slides for the women's rights class there would be a three up is is women's rights the third class i'm sorry civil and political rights is the third class so women's rights would be like the fifth class. So if I had an article for women's rights, five, the slides for women's rights would be, have a five up front and then women's rights slides. And then the reading for that class would be five and then the title of the reading. So you'd see everything under, that started with the number five is for that fifth class on women's rights and so on for all the other, for all the other sessions. So it's good to read everything for that class so for the if that for the you know for that fifth class on women's rights i'll have that uploaded by the fourth class which you see on the syllabus is may 19th the class is assigned scheduled for may 26th so that gives you time to read you know look at the article and look at the slides before you watch the lecture on the 26th and while you're going through the slides you can um well oh, so as you can already tell, this course is will be conducted in English, and I understand uh, English can some. Not only is it in English, but this is also uh, a class um, designed around legal issues. So often, I'm going to use legal terms of art, legal vocabulary. Uh, so there may be words that you haven't heard before. You can look them up in the dictionary. But that's one reason why it's good to look at the slides in advance. And if you see some words that you don't recognize, you can look them up and that will help you understand what I'm talking about. And also on the Hopi site, you can ask, I'll put up a discussion for each class and then you can ask directly, I don't understand this term, or you said this, what does that mean? Or you wrote this in the slides and I don't understand what it means. And you can ask directly and then I can answer that. Okay, so let's actually start with, um, <clears throat> I think that's a good overview of the class. Uh, so let's actually start with the material for today, which is the introduction to human rights law. And let's move to the slides, uh, one intro to IHRL slides. So I'm gonna be looking at that from now. Uh, <clears throat> so we see this opening page, introduction to human rights law. Uh, IHRL stands for International Human Rights Law. Let's look at page two. And the question at the top uh, says, what are human rights? And then it has human rights are, and then it has this list of different features. So before we even look at the features, this is 
our first question. This is our first discussion question that I want you to think about before I even get to uh, how international human rights law looks at it, which is what do you think human rights are? What's your image of when someone tells you about human rights? Um, what do you think a human right is? What defines a human right? And uh, so this would be even a time you can stop the video and think about it to yourself. If someone asked you, what is a human right? Or what's the definition of a human right? What answer would you give? So think about that for a second, and then let's go back. Okay, so let's look at how uh, international human rights looks at it. So the very first feature that we see is uh, laws. Human rights must be laws. So this is the first major difference between how uh, people out in the public generally think about human rights and how a lawyer, international lawyer, thinks about human rights under international human rights law is that uh, a human right is a law. So in public discourse, you hear a lot of time, you know, you'll hear people sometimes say, you know, uh, oh, you're, you know, uh, one person tries to silence another person, you know, just tells them to be quiet and won't listen. Uh, or, you know, they're, they're trying to talk on a, a microphone and someone cuts the microphone so that they're, their speech isn't getting out. And the person may say, oh, that's violating my human rights. I have a, I have a right to speech and you just violated that. Um, there's a lot of activities that happen out in the world that can be bad, but they're not necessarily human rights. So human rights isn't just bad behavior that happens in the world. Um, from a lawyer's perspective, a human right is a legal obligation. It's actually written into the law, you know, like uh, there's like we have the criminal code that um, writes laws down. And when a crime, when a criminal breaks the law, it's according to the standard that was written down. Um, so it's not just that they did something bad that made it a criminal. It's because a law was actually enacted in legislation. And here's the law book and it's actually written down. That's a, that's a legal obligation that they've broken. So human rights laws like that. Human rights are laws. Um, <clears throat> what that means above anything else is uh, if someone asks you what a human right is, it's a law. The thing about laws is they have to have a source. So every human right obligation that exists has to have a source, a legal source. Uh, so in domestic law, uh, when we talk about legal source, what we mean is the legislature. Here in Japan, we have the Diet. In America, we have the Congress. Uh, you know, they have Parliament in the UK. The legislature passes a law by whatever process they pass a law. You know, the, the members of the legislature vote on it or whatever process they use to make something a legal obligation for that country. Um, that act of passing a law and writing it into the books is the source of that law for that country. So for international law is very similar. Laws have to have a source. And if there isn't a legal source for a law, then we have this uh, principle in international law. Some, sometimes they say international law is like a vacuum, whereas if there isn't a legal source, then there isn't a guidance. International law isn't telling you Laws don't exist outside of sources. And we're going to talk about what are the major sources in international law. One of the major sources is treaties. So if someone, if two countries pass a treaty together and then ratify it, then that treaty becomes a legal source. So the human rights obligation comes out of that treaty as a legal source. Um, so one complicating factor that we're going to get to a little later on is that sometimes you can have legal sources that aren't written down. Um, in domestic law, in certain countries, in common law countries like the UK and America and India, um, countries like this, the common law is um, an unwritten source of law. It's by, done by case law. Um, so international law has a source of unwritten laws that are still considered sources. And the term we use for this is called customary international law. Uh, so these are for the most serious human rights violations, things like no slavery or, um, you know, uh, genocide, 
um, torture, some of these most serious ones, you don't have to actually pass a treaty for these to be legal, legal obligations. These are legal obligations. It's kind of built into the structure of, of international society that these are the most serious kinds of crimes that must be illegal. Um, so we're going to get to, and they're not written in it. They don't have, they're an obligation even if they're not written down. So, but legally speaking, customary international law, which is what we call that category, even though it's not written down, it's still a legal source. It's a recognized legal source because states recognize it as a legal source. So if you had a principle that's not in a treaty and it's not in customary international law, it doesn't have a legal source, then it's not a human rights. Then it's not a human right. And we're going to talk about the there's a practice in international human rights law where uh, norms, what we call standards or norms, develop, where a group of people, you know, people that think about human rights issues a lot, recognize, uh, well, the internet is a good one. The internet is a new technology, and there may be certain rights developing in the online sphere that are very new. So, you know, they're developing before we've had time to make a treaty and for them to develop into customary international law. Um, so, for example, like the right to information. This is a, some people consider the right to information as a developing human right. Um, and then we ask, is, so a right to information just means when um, certain, uh, when certain events happen, where the where the public needs good information, then the government has a duty to give information about that. So for example, public health and safety issues after the nuclear disaster in Fukushima here in Japan or in Chernobyl in the Soviet Union um, or, uh, or during the, this COVID, this coronavirus um, era that we're going through right now, uh, if the government has information that can protect public safety, it may have a duty to give that information. We call that the right to information. Um, but does it come from a source? So we're going to talk about some human rights are kind of in a gray zone where it's not really clear if they've hardened into a legal source yet. It's not really clear if they're a legal duty yet. So for something to be a human right, it has to be a legal obligation. But there are some developing human rights. And um, I'm going to use, I'm going to explain it a little more later, but uh, human rights don't come out of a vacuum. Uh, very often they develop over a long period of time where uh, when it first starts, we, we don't say this is a human right, we say this is just a standard. This is just a good, like a best practice. This is a best practice or a standard states should do, but it's not a legal obligation yet. Uh, but over time, it may develop. So over time, states may come together and actually pass a treaty and that will make it into a law. Or it will develop into customary international law and that gives it a source and now it's a law. So, um, so we're going to talk about that a little more. Uh, so once we have a source for international law, um, what does that give you? And then we can see that in the second, uh, the second element in our list, standards. So human rights tell you exactly how to act or not to act. So sometimes people say, um, well, this is like criminal law. Uh, when you have a trial for a criminal case, um, the lawyers are going to argue the prosecution and the defense are going to argue whether this criminal actually broke the law. So everybody may even admit that this person did something bad, but that doesn't make it a crime yet. It's a crime because there's elements, because the law writes very specifically the standards of when you've broken the law. And just doing something bad doesn't make it illegal yet. It's illegal if you violate the standards according to how it's written in the law. So that's why we have standards here. So when people just throw out, um, people have titles for rights, you know, oh, I have a right to freedom of expression. I have, a, yeah, I have freedom of speech, or I have freedom of religion, or I have, you know, um, I have a human right to move around. Um, the term freedom of speech doesn't tell you anything yet. It's just the label for that right. But to actually know 
what the law does is it gives you standards to know when someone does a certain action that stops you from speaking, it gives you a standard, a very clear standard of whether you're violating the law or whether you're following the law. So human rights needs to be specific. It needs to give a specific standard. That's why uh, it's really, that's why the most useful human rights law are the ones written down in treaties because the text of the right gives you the content, it gives you the standard, and it should be clear enough so that when a person violates a human right, it's very clear according to the text when there's a violation and when there's not. It tells people exactly how to act, exactly how to be compliant with the law. So we're going to talk about cases where a lot of states, um, so authoritarian states that um, want to violate a human right for whatever reason, you know, uh, a, a government that is threat feels threatened, so it wants to silence an opposition because it's afraid it might lose the next election or something like that. So it wants to violate a human right. Very often states like this, they will uh, talk about human rights in a very general way and just say, oh, you have a very general um, freedom of speech, but uh, they use such broad and vague language that they're allowed to violate the stop speech all the time. And they just say, well, it's for public interest. We're helping the public. Or they'll just invent you know, some reason to stop the speech. Um, and because their law is written so vaguely, it's so vague, it's so uh, open to interpretation, that um, the point is, if a human right doesn't give you a clear standard of when the law is broken, then it's not really a human right because then governments will just break it all the time and just because the language is so vague that allows them to do that, um, a human right isn't a human right unless it stops, unless there's clear violation behavior that it prohibits that is illegal. So if, you're, if the way a human right is written down doesn't stop any behavior, all behavior could be done, you can stop speech at any time according to this text, then that's not really a human right because it needs to give you a standard. It needs to be a legal obligation when you're clearly violating the law and clearly not violating it, and it shouldn't be in vague language. Uh, so the third uh, option that we see are duties. So this is what I've just... This is what I just said. Um, human rights has to give states, has to give parties an obligation. And we're going to talk a little later. The party that usually has to follow the law is government officials, the government. They're the most typical actor that has to follow human rights obligations. But there can be other actors that have to follow human rights obligations too. We'll get more to that later. But the point here is just to stay, is just to say that Human rights are duties. Uh, a human right has to give a legal obligation. So according to that clear standard, there's legal behavior and there's illegal behavior. There's a very clear standard. So when a person does an action, it's very clear, are they violating the law or are they compliant with the law? And if they're violating the law, then now they've broken the law. And that standard was a legal obligation. So human rights are not human rights unless they give someone an obligation that they can violate. Um, so human rights gives duties to act or not act, you know, to refrain from acting. Don't torture someone. So now that we have, uh, laws that give standards of obligations, what happens if the government or some actor violates the law, violates a human rights law? What happens? So if a human right is violated, if the duty is broken, then there has to be some consequence. So a human right isn't a human right unless there's a consequence to breaking the law. Uh, this is just like, you know, in criminal law, the criminal law doesn't really work unless there's punishment for someone breaking the law. If someone breaks the law and there's no punishment, then it's not really a legal obligation. And, um, so the main way we put under international human rights law, the main area where we cover that is under remedies. So if there's, if a, um, so a human right is owed to an individual, a person has a human right and um, the actor that's, you know, 
And then another actor has the obligation not to violate that human right. So if a human right is violated, uh, we'll talk this about this a little more, but human rights are two sides of a coin. One party has a right and one party has a duty. The potential victim has the right not to be tortured and a police department, you know, has a duty not to torture the victim. Uh, so the right and the duty are connected. So if the law is broken, that those two sides of the coin must have a legal consequence. So the party that violated the law needs should be sanctioned or punished in some respect. And then the party, the potential victim that received the violation, so the person that was tortured that shouldn't have been, they had a right not to be tortured. So they deserve a remedy. So if there's a violation, uh, the party that broke it should be sanctioned or punished, and the party that had the right uh, should get some kind of remedy. Um, and then we'll talk about the different kinds of remedies. But for something like torture, you know, they've had physical abuse, uh, they should get some kind of compensation. If they have medical bills, those should be paid for. They may have psychological problems that need handling. Um, so uh, things, and then they definitely need reassurances that this is never going to happen again. So these are the kind of remedies that uh, victims should get if the law is broken. All right, so those first four uh, properties, law, standards, duties, and remedies, or some a legal consequence to violating it. This is the core of this is the core of legal duties generally, but it's but including human rights. So when we talk about international human rights law, we're talking about human rights as laws, um, as legal obligations that come from a source. Okay, so the next couple of um, so all these features we just talked about are kind of common to any legal obligation. You could use this also for criminal law. The next couple of properties are what's specific about human rights generally. So the first one we see is universal um, when we're speaking about international human rights law. Uh, and let me again distinguish, we're talking about international human rights law. So I'm going to be in this course, we're talking about human rights law that exists in international law. Uh, because there's also, of course, human rights that is passed in domestic law. So many, most countries have a constitution, and some basic rights will be provided for in their constitution, and the legislature may pass human rights in their domestic law. And this is, but we're talking about duties at the international human rights level. Um, and then the international duties, of course, are incorporated into domestic law. You can go to a domestic court sometimes. Well, that, that gets complicated, but the point is, is on the international human rights law, when we talk about human rights in international human rights law, these human rights apply to everyone, everyone in the world, it, they're universal. So that means like something like the freedom of expression or uh, right to health. Um, this is a human right that applies to everyone in the world. It's universal. Uh, so what that means is countries do not get to pick and choose which basic human rights they want. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more with the distinction between civil and political rights and economic and social rights. In history, during the Cold War period, you had a communist bloc and uh, the liberal uh, bloc, um, and they sometimes tried to separate human rights, where the liberal bloc really cared about things like freedom of speech, and, you know, democracy, right to vote, a uh, fair trial. And the communist bloc cared about things like right to health, food, right to food, everybody, you know, right to work, um, which are called economic and social rights. And there was a tendency in history to sometimes separate this, where countries were picking and choosing the basic human rights they wanted and rejecting others. Um, the, the way we think about human rights law now is that human right, the basic human rights uh, that we talk about in this course, um, that we'll talk about in the core treaties are universal. States don't, don't get to pick and choose which of those human rights they're gonna follow. They, they're supposed to be universal, they apply to everyone. Um, we're gonna talk about, so, sometimes there are certain countries that want to give reservations, that want to say this law should apply a little differently for our, for our country. Um, a really typical example is like some uh, some um, uh, Islamic majority 
uh, countries in the Middle East, for example, want to have certain reservations for women's rights. Uh, and that's a case where, um, where there's a difference, but where countries want to have, where they want to argue that there's a cultural particularity that in our culture, uh, this law should be applied a little differently. So the way we normally talk about that, whereas, um, so the way we normally talk about that is uh, sometimes in terms of a margin of appreciation. So international human rights law uh, will typically say that the human right itself is universal, but we recognize that different countries have different cultures and they may apply this law a little differently depending on their culture. Um, so that's a little different point. So in cases like that, um, the international community, first of all, will try to argue every state should pass the core human rights. Um, so there's a strong advocacy push in the international community that international human rights law should be universal. All the human rights should apply to all the countries, every, everyone. Uh, but they recognize, uh, so they'll say the duty, you have to follow this, this human rights law as an obligation universally for every country. And, but then they will recognize, but different countries may apply this, you know, the methods they use to enforce this law may be different by their culture. So that's a little different than saying human rights aren't universal. That's the, that's the major trend in international human rights law is saying that international human rights laws should be universal, uh, but we recognize you can implement them differently by the, um, the culture. But even then, um, the international human rights law bodies practically, they don't like too much cultural variation. They still think because often states can use culture as an excuse to violate basic human rights, to have bad violations. So the, in, so these international human rights bodies have a tendency to be very narrow uh, about allowing states to use culture possibly as an excuse to violate human rights. So anyway, universality. Uh, I should also mention um, one issue with universality is of course the colonial context, the, the context, the history of colonialism. So there's a lot of countries, um, of course in the developing world, many countries were colonized. Um, and during the colonial period, they had, for example, European governments governing them that were committing terrible human rights violations. But these, at the same time, these governments, these European governments at the time, this is in the 19th century and early 20th century, um, were arguing, you know, that democracy and human rights are of value, but they're committing terrible human rights violations. Um, and this was a kind of traumatic experience for a lot of these countries. Uh, and then during decolonization, when you had new governments take over these developing countries, um, often the new governments in the developing countries would repeat the colonial experience. So now you had governments with the same, you know, they're not Europeans ruling them, it's their own people now, but the new governments are still committing human rights violations. Um, but this colonial history is a complication to the universality. So some countries may uh, suspect, they may have suspicion about Europeans, for example, look having human rights look like this european export that's saying you universal means you have to be like europe uh so this is an argument sometimes made in the past about certain countries trying to argue against the universality of human rights um that's not a good argument these days so in the current period um there's been a lot of developments but one is uh, in a lot of these developing countries, the people that are pushing human rights aren't Europeans and Americans or Japanese anymore. Um, there's inside these countries themselves, there's indigenous groups, there's groups inside the country itself that are advocating for human rights. So the argument that human rights are a European export uh, that aren't indigenous to their culture isn't really accurate anymore because now human rights have been absorbed and into every country. And there's always a community in every country of people advocating for human rights in their own terms. So when we, so universality doesn't mean your country has to be like Europe. So now we have, you know, countries like, you know, Nigeria and Africa or whatever, where you have Nigerian human rights groups and they've developed the body of human rights law uh, that is consistent, for example, with the Nigerian norms. 
or uh, in Asia, we see it, you know, in countries like um, Thailand or Myanmar, or Cambodia, that are Buddhist countries, you have human rights communities in those countries that are developing human rights laws and standards consistent with uh, um, the norms and values, you know, inside Cambodia or inside Myanmar. So um, these are still universal duties to protect, for example, someone's life or right to speak. Uh, but these aren't, but they're making it, you know, their own. They're taking ownership of these human rights. So it's not like a European export. So the that's the kind of trend to address that question of, you know, is our human rights just a new form of colonialism? So we wouldn't, the international community still wants to push the universality, but universality doesn't mean every country has to be like a European country or America. Universality means there are certain minimum standards of protection for people to protect, um, but you can um, adopt these human rights according to your own culture and according to your own values. And then uh, that goes right along with the, the the element right under universal, which you see is equal. So uh, human rights apply the same for everyone. Uh, so for example, if someone has a right to speech, uh, in the American context, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. If you're a black person or a white person, the freedom of speech applies equally. So this is a kind of non-discrimination. So, um, so we are gonna talk about human rights law applies equally. Uh, but of course, there are certain vulnerable groups that have special uh, needs. So for example, women's rights, of course, women have special, uh, there are special considerations involved in non-discrimination against women that are going to be targeting, of course, women as a group. Um, so when we talk about the equality of human rights law, what we're really talking about is, again, those core human rights. Uh, and in the next slide, we're going to talk about what the core human rights are, but these, you know, freedom of speech, uh, right to health, these kind of core human rights, fair trial, need to apply equally to everyone. All right, so what's really at the foundation of human rights? Where do human rights really come from? Um, if you think about there's so many different cultures and different religions, different belief systems, uh, if you say, you know, uh, so the basic, the most basic of human rights is right to life. Here's a good question to ask yourself before I move on, and you can stop the video and think about it. Um, what's really at the source of human rights? So when we say it's wrong to kill someone, where does that come from? What, what do you think? What is really kind of at the foundation of human rights? So take a second to think about that. So if we look at um, this uh, list, the next term is dignity, about dignity. So there's a central connecting element that's kind of at the core of all of international human rights law. Of course, human rights are uh, legal obligations that give legal standards. And you know, if you violate it, there needs to be some legal consequence. They apply to everyone and equally. But what actually are they trying to do? What is a human right trying to do? So at the core of human rights is really human dignity, the dignity of humans. It means treating other humans with a certain level of respect that treats them as humans and not, for example, like animals, although even animals should not be mistreated, but definitely or, or objects. Um, so the right to torture is a good way to see that when um, when the police or military torture someone to get information from them. Um, they're treating another human being as an object. They're like breaking that human in a way that doesn't give respect or dignity to another human being. Uh, and if you think about that, and if you think about it that way, a problem with something of torture is not only that you may have an innocent person being mistreated like that, being beat up. Um, there's a term that, uh, there's a, a, a phrase we have in English. Um, when you're, uh, uh, there's a phrase we have in English. Uh, when you're fighting monsters, there's a risk that you may become the monster. So it's something like if you're fighting terrorists, you may start. You know, the police may start want to ad to adopt terrorist tactics, and torture is an example of that, where um, they're so they're so afraid of another group that they're willing to break that person.
so in that sense, the, a problem with torture is not only that a victim gets beat up, but the, per the people perpetrating the torture are becoming inhuman themselves. They're starting to become monsters because they're ready to cross this line and treat another human in an inhuman way. So human rights law really at the core is respecting the dignity of other human beings. It's not treating other humans in an inhuman way. So, of course, you can have criminals that are very terrible people and they should be, you know, go to prison. Um, but even in sending a criminal to prison, you don't have to treat them like they're not human. You can't treat them like an object or an animal. Um, so they have basic human rights. Every human, just by virtue of being a human, you have certain rights. Uh, you have a certain dignity as a human and can't be treated like an object. That's really at the core of all these human rights is a certain respect for the dignity of humans. All right. Uh, and then the next term we see below that are complete. So human rights are indivisible and interdependent. Um, this has to, this is again, similar with the universal point. Um, states don't get to pick and choose the human rights they want. Uh, and also they can't, if you have a freedom of speech, you know, you can't divide that. You can't protect the speech you like, but not protect the speech you don't like. You have to protect all of speech. Um, it's indivisible. You can't divide. Indivisible means you can't divide it. So you can't separate human rights out where you protect the things you like and don't protect the parts you don't like. Human rights law tells you you have to protect all of that's protected. They're indivisible. And, um, and you can't separate them. So interdependent means that all the rights work together. You can't take some rights and separate out other rights. They're interdependent. So for example, those two examples I keep using again, you know, freedom of speech and, um, you know, right to health, or right to education, you know, right to health, freedom of speech and right to health. Um, if you want to protect people's health, then scientists need to be able to speak good information about how to fight the sickness. That's a situation we're going through right now with this uh, COVID-19 problem. We can see the connection between freedom of speech and right to health. If we want to protect people's health, then scientists need to be able to speak openly. And we've seen when the governments, governments can get afraid of uh, bad, you know, they can get afraid of their power base being um, being unsettled. So government may be tempted to silence scientists telling the truth about a disease. So they're violating the freedom of speech, but we can see that can lead to practices that will let, lead to more people getting sick and dying. So it will affect the freedom of the right to health. So in that way, we can see how freedom of expression and right to health are connected and of course, if people are getting sick, they can't speak openly. You know, you can have populations that aren't able to voice themselves because they're sick and dying. Uh, so the right to health is also essential for freedom of speech. So we can see how these two rights are interdependent. And if you look through, you know, again, that sheet of all the different human rights that... Um, the, the fundamentals sheet, you know, we have all these human rights. What interdependent means when you look down at all these different human rights, they're all connected. So all the, almost every human right, there are certain ways that it reinforces the other human rights. And this is why you need to take all of the human rights together. You can't pick and choose and take out and decide to follow some human rights, but not other human rights because they're interdependent. Uh, if you don't have freedom of speech, then you don't have right to health. You have to have both of them together for them to mutually reinforce each other. And then uh, what's the final goal of human rights? And that's this, this final item at the bottom, you see protection. Human rights are about protecting individuals and sometimes protecting groups. Uh, so at the end of the day, human rights are about protecting people. People, uh, some, for almost every human right, basically for every human right, you have a potential victim. A victim of a violation has some aspect of them that's injured. They can be physically injured or mentally injured, or they can't participate in public life. They're not allowed to speak. They're not allowed to move uh, around the country. Uh, you know, they're arbitrarily arrested. So they suffered a, a loss of liberty. Um, Something has been taken away. Some fundamental part of their freedom has been 
uh, has been injured. And the job of human rights is to protect against these injuries. So if you see some, so a good way to find out where human rights problems happening is when you're reading the newspaper or looking at a situation happening out in the world, are people being injured in some way? Are they losing some kind of freedom or losing something? They want to do something that they can't or they're injured in some way. Uh, that's a really good sign that somewhere there's a human rights problem. There's a human rights violation somewhere in there. Uh, so human rights law are about protecting people. Okay. Okay, so about half the class was just going over what are human rights, just that first page. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to go over um, the rest of the slides. So now we're on page three of the slides. Uh, this is the history of modern human rights. I'll go over this relatively briefly. Uh, so human rights, the concept of human rights themselves has a long history. Uh, of course, in a lot of religious tradi traditions going back thousands of years, they had lots of ethical norms like don't kill people, don't steal. Um, so a lot of the, you know, kind of basic thinking of protecting people was already, you know, has been in humanity for, for a long time. Um, the classical sense of human rights was developed uh, in terms of limits on government intrusion. So governments stopping people from speaking or uh, arbitrarily arresting people, this concept, this classic concept of human rights um, that developed in the Enlightenment in the 17th century, the Enlightenment period in Europe, countries like the Netherlands, the UK, France, um, and then later Western Europe. Um, this is the kind of classic period of human rights. Um, <clears throat> but the way we talk about international human rights law today has a really specific origin, and that's in the post-war period. So, uh, so while some basic human rights developed in international law before World War II, you know, you had certain treaties, you know, like an anti-slavery act, and you had certain campaign, international campaigns. Um, under the modern system, the modern system of international human rights law works under the UN structure. And that comes from the post-war period. And, you know, after World War II in 1945, 46, they developed the United Nations. Um, and when they were developing the United Nations, one of the tasks of the United Nations was to develop human rights protections. Um, so in 1945, you had the UN Charter, and then the first basic document uh, to uh, encapsulate all the core human rights duty was called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. On this page, it says the UN Declaration, but um, it's the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, UDHR. So that was passed in 1948. Um, so the Universal Declaration, if we look back again at our fundamentals sheet, uh, you can see, again, we had those two boxes, ICCPR and ICESCR, that has all this list of human rights under them and bullet points. Um, all of these were originally part of the Universal, not all of them, almost all of them, were originally in this Universal Declaration of Human Rights document. That's at the top, in the top box. Um, so the Universal Declaration isn't a treaty. Um, they're considered, uh, these laws are considered legal obligations because they're considered customary international law. States recognize them as law, but it's not a treaty. Uh, the states wanted to give more detail and actually make treaties out of these human rights. But during the time, it was uh, the Cold War. And I mentioned before that the liberal states and communist states were dividing over two different categories of human rights protections, uh, which we call civil and political rights and economic and social rights on the other hand. So civil and political rights are things about limiting government authority, like the government can't stop you from speaking or it can't, it must give you a fair trial. And economic and social rights are about protections the government gives you, things like right to health, freedom of, uh, right to education, social security, work. Um, okay. 
So it took them almost 20 years to pass treaties finally, and they had to do it as two separate treaties. And these treaties were passed in 1966, the ICCPR and the ICESCR. So the I, uh, that's Internet, International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, and ICESCR stands for Interna International Covenant of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. So the key letters in those, CP, for civil and political rights on the ICCPR side and on the ICSCR side, the key letters are ES, economic and social rights. So we have civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social rights. Um, even though they passed these treaties, the human rights system still wasn't very active during the Cold War period because of course you had these two blocks of states uh, that couldn't agree much in the international sphere. Um, and then after these two treaties passed, we had a lot of smaller human rights treaties passed. We had not, not necessarily smaller. We had other human rights treaties passed on special issues. And again, looking at our fundamentals list, that was that bottom right box of other human rights treaties. And if you look at that box, you can see, you know, there's ICERD for racial discrimination, CAT for torture, CEDA for women's rights, children's rights, migrant rights, disabled persons. So these are all of these treaties that were passed in the 1970s all the way up to today, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, so at so bef so during all this period of the Cold War, you had these treaties being passed, but they weren't being implemented very well. Um, since the Cold War ended in 1991, a structure has developed in the United, in international governments and the UN system to directly address human rights issues. And in particular, two UN bodies were created. In 1993, we had OHCHR created, which is the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. This is the UN's body for uh, human rights, and we'll talk about it next class. And then in 2006, the Human Rights Council, which is a council of state bodies um that talk about human rights issues and these two bodies are meant are to design to help implement and uh, do international governance over human rights issues so we have the treaties and then we have these bodies and we're going to talk next week about this system of uh human rights uh the international human rights law system we'll talk about in the next class so for the rest of this class, we're going to talk about the um, human rights system, how human rights law works as law. <laughs> um, so some of this is what I've already said when we were going through that list on the first page, but this will give a little more um, detail to it and make it explicit. So uh, in human rights law, you always need three groups of people, three types of actors. There are rights holders, there are duty holders, and there are enforcers. And that's, I'm on page four of the slides now. Um, so the uh, rights holders, duties holders, and enforcers. So like I said uh, earlier, human rights law is like a two sides of a coin. Every right has a duty, every duty has a right. So what that means is for every, uh, a human right is a legal obligation. So for every legal obligation, there's one party that has to follow that obligation, that if they don't do what they're supposed to, they've broken the law. These are the duty holders. And on the other side of the coin, uh, like I said before, human rights are about protection. So uh, that obligation to follow the law is to protect a potential victim, to protect a victim. So those victims, when they get a violation, those are the rights holders. So we can look at this box. Right holders are people that the human rights protects, potential victims. And under international human rights law, that applies to everyone. Uh, and for the treaties, the ICCPR and ICESCR, these obligations apply to everyone inside your territory. So we're currently in Japan. That means, um, you know, uh, so for freedom of speech in a country like Japan, who has the freedom of speech uh, that the government of Japan has to respect? That's all of us that are inside the territory of Japan whether you're a citizen or a foreigner, everyone inside the territory of Japan is a rights holder. So if the freedom of speech is violated, we have our freedom of speech that's violated, now we have a legal claim uh, against the person that broke the violation. So everyone inside the territory uh, is a right holder. They And what I mean also, again, in legal terms, it means you if there's a violation, you have a legal claim. 
Um, if it were domestic law, it means you could go to a court and assert your legal claim and bring some kind of legal process to, um, you know, get a remedy for your claim. Uh, duty holders. So that's the people that must follow the human rights law, potential abusers. So classically, the major duty holder for most human rights are state officials. It's usually not private people. So when we talk about the freedom of speech, that means the government has a duty not to silence you. But if your friend silences you, that's not the that's not a human rights violation because your friend isn't the government. It's when the government violates it. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if a person kills you, if a private person, a criminal kills you, that sounds like a human rights um, that sounds like a human rights violation. I have a right to life. But the, um, the party that owes the duty to protect me from being killed is still the government. The government's job is to stop the other private party. So duty holders, um, those are the people that have the legal obligation. If there's a violation, they've broken a violation and there should be some kind of sanction. Uh, so now you can see the legal status of rights holders and duty holders. If there's a violation, the rights holders have a legal claim to, you know, ideally to bring some kind of process, but they have a legal claim because they had a right that was taken. And then the duty holders, they had an obligation. And if they violate it, they've triggered a legal process. You know, they've triggered a legal status that they're in violation of a law and there could be some kind of punishment or sanction. So we have the rights holders and duty holders. What are we missing? If we, if someone violates the law, what do you need to make, you know, to have the legal process uh, resolve that? Of course, you need enforcers. So people have, you need people to have to police and enforce the law. Um, if human rights aren't enforced, then they're not really laws. Laws mean there's some kind of enforcement. There's a legal status that's triggered, and that means some official actors can act based on that triggering of that legal status of a violation, for example. Uh, so we call these the enforcers. Um, so in typical, you know, like in criminal law, if someone breaks, if someone commits a crime like murder, uh, of course, the major official, well, you can think for yourself, who are the state officials involved in resolving that? It's going to be the police and then the court system. The police will investigate and the courts will resolve it. Uh, so ideally for international human rights law, um, we're going to talk about just disability. Sometimes it's hard to bring human rights to a court, but the court is the kind of actor that resolves legal cases like human rights cases. You need some kind of official actor. It's not always a court and it's not always the police, but they're the kinds of official actors that can resolve cases. And then we see this uh, diagram at the bottom. You have rights holders on one side, duty bearers on the other side, and then forces in the middle that are mediating between the two. Now one issue, we have an expression in English called the, um, be careful that the foxes don't watch the chickens. It means if you're trying to protect chickens, uh, you don't want to have a fox guarding them because there's a risk that the fox will eat the chickens. This is a problem, this is a potential problem here because two sides do we have three boxes here, victims, enforcer, and duty bearers? Two of those boxes are filled by the same actor, and that's the state, the government. So the government has a duty to follow the law, and if they break that, another part of the state is the one that's supposed to resolve the case, like take them to court. So we can get a case where sometimes the state can be colluding with itself, and you can get, in, you can get police that, uh, for example, torture someone, and then in certain, case, in certain countries where they don't have a mature legal system, they have maybe a corrupt legal system, the courts may actually defend the police uh, in that case. So that's, and that's, a, that's a case of the fox guarding the chickens. The, um, the victims can't really trust the courts to protect them. So that's one potential limiting part about human rights law is the state is the one often breaking the law the, a human rights law, but you also need the state. You also need the state or some officials to enforce the law. So uh, for some countries, that might be a challenge. So that's one challenge for human rights law working. There can be other cases, you know, for major war crimes where you might have an international court or outside bodies um, enforcing the law when their own when the country's own court system can't do it. And we're going to talk about that later. That can also have its own complications. So this is one challenge to human rights law.
Uh, and then, of course, there's the UN Human Rights System. I mentioned OHCHR and the Human Rights Council. This can help uh, all three groups with how human rights are enforced. And we'll talk about that more in the next class. So I've already mentioned, now I'm on page five, the core human rights treaties. You have the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, that one passed in the 1940s, and the ICCPR and ICESCR. We're going to have a class just on the ICCPR and just on the ICESCR, so I'm not going to talk much about them for now. The ICCPR is usually about protecting people from arbitrary punishment for being different. Examples are right to life, right to speech, a right to privacy, fair trial, and economic and social rights are about a minimum standard of a good life. So things like you have enough food, you have a house, you're healthy, you've got an education, you can work. These are all, you know, these rights are about having a, it's not having a good life, but it's just not falling below a minimum standard where you're having a bad life an adequate standard of living. That's economic and social rights. And we'll have classes just for those treaties. So uh, we'll get into a lot of details in them in those classes. On page six, you see some other major international human rights law treaties, CDAWs for women's rights, the CRC for children's rights, CAT for uh, the T Convention Against Torture, CERD is the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, the CMW for migrant workers, CRPD for disability rights, uh we're going to in this class we're going to go over all of these treaties and more uh so these are just other major international human rights treaties and we'll talk more about how treaty bodies uh how treaties work in the next class uh well we'll talk about how they're implemented all right uh, i'll get back to a little how treaties work in a minute uh, so on page seven now, we see the different types of rights. So there are three basic types of human rights. There's respect rights, protect rights, and fulfill rights. Um, and this has to do with the relationship. Uh, what does the, when we say the duty bearer, the party that has to follow the obligation. Remember, that's one of the sides of the coin. There's always a party that has to follow the obligation. That's usually the state. Um, what do they have to actually do? These types of, uh, these are types of duties. So there are three types of duties. Duty to respect, duty to protect, and duty to fulfill. I know this says types of rights, but actually we can change this to types of duties. So the uh, duty to respect means the state has to stop itself from violating a right. A state has a duty not to violate the right itself. So this is usually a duty to refrain. So if you look at something like the right, the right to freedom from torture, the state has a duty not to torture someone. So if the state does nothing, then they've followed, they're following the law, they're compliant with it. So that's the duty to respect the right to uh, freedom from torture means the state does not torture someone. That's, it's respecting that right by not doing the uh, violation. So the state stops itself. So the duty to protect means the state stops private parties or some other entity from violating the right. So if we look at the uh, right to life, you know, the state, a duty to respect the right to life means the state does not kill people. But we can have non-state actors also kill people. Criminals can kill people. And even things like a hurricane or some natural disaster can also kill people. So when we talk about the duty to protect the right to life, that means the state stops other entities from violating that right. So the state has to stop criminals from killing people, for example, by having trials and uh, incarcerating them in prisons. And if you have, you know, right now we have a disease that's killing people. The state has a duty to protect the right to life by taking measures to prevent this disease from killing people. Uh, or if you have, or, you know, during the Fukushima natural disaster, or other natural disasters like typhoons, uh, the state has a duty to protect people from being killed from these natural disasters. That's a duty to protect the right to life. So remember, duty to respect a right means the state itself doesn't violate the right. And the duty to protect the right means the state stops other entities, other actors from violating the right, either private people or even nature or anything that can violate the right. All right, the third category of duty are fulfilled duties. Um, a fulfilled duty means 
the state takes positive action. So remember, for the duty to respect and protect, the state is mostly stopping violations. The state either stops itself, it stops its police from torturing people, or it stops criminals from killing people. That's stopping, you know, just don't do it, stop. To fulfill rights, the state needs to take positive action. It needs to spend money and spend resources. Uh, to fulfill rights. So for example, these are often economic and social rights. So things like if you want to fulfill the right to education, you need to have schools. If you want to fulfill the right to health, you need to build hospitals, you know, positive actions. So these are fulfill rights. So most human rights have res an, a respect duty, a protect duty, and a fulfill duty. This, is, this tells you what the state has to do to follow the law. Respect the duty, respect the right, protect the right, and fulfill the right. All right, and on page eight, we see the difference between hard law and soft law. So uh, a hard law means um, a legal duty is binding. So if a state doesn't do it, it's broken the law. Um, that's just the normal way we usually talk about law. The, the issue that's interesting uh, and more complex is soft law. So soft law is a non-binding non standard. So I mentioned before about a lot of the genesis the uh, origins of human rights before they were solid legal obligations they were standard and they gave an example for example of the the free the right to information the right to information isn't necessarily a hard legal duty in international customary law yet or it's debatable some people say it is and some people say it isn't um, but it's definitely a standard that states should follow so when we talk about the standard that states should follow but it's not completely crystallized into binding law, we call this soft law. So soft law is something states should follow, but it might not necessarily be a legal violation, but it's not legally good to do either. If you want to put it in terms of uh, stoplights, a red stoplight is a definite legal violation if you cross it. Soft law is more like a yellow light. And I'll give an example of a, um, legal obligations harden over time. So I'll give an analogy. Uh, so one analogy is um, when a legal is cutting through a forest, a jungle, and you're cutting a path. And so the first activist, when they're cutting through a path, they uh, create, you know, they just chop their way, but it doesn't create a road yet. And then future cases come and they chop a little more. And over time, you're building a path and eventually a road. And when it's settled as a road, now that's customary international law. That's a hard legal obligation. You need to follow this road. But before we've gotten to that point where they're still chopping it, they're just a legal standard. It's developing into a road, but it's still along the way. Another example I like is a, an ex, a, a thing we did when I was in elementary school. We had a glass of water and we put sugar in it and you can color it and you put a pencil and tie a string and the string goes in the water and you put it by a window and leave it for a week. Do you know what will happen? The sugar will clump onto the string and you pull it out and it's a kind of rock candy. So these sugar particles are like legal standards. When they crystallize on the string, now they're hard international obligations. If you break them, you've violated the law and can go to court. Uh, but before they've crystallized on the string, they're little particles of sugar that are they're starting to harden. So they're not they're developing there. So this is a bit how human rights law works too. Is there's a lot of human rights that are soft law standards. They're not completely hardened into legal obligations, but states still need to follow them. And the job of civil society is to harden these, uh, these, these standards. So every case, every time there's a case on this issue, um, the standard will harden a little more into a legal duty. That gives you really specific guidance. So that's how soft law works. Um, and then on page nine, you'll see some examples. So if you want to talk about what are the sources of hard law, well, of course, we have treaties. Treaties are like a contract. Two states will sign a document. And then uh, what really makes a, a treaty law is the state takes it back to their home country and they ratify it. Ratify it means your home legislature passes it as a domestic law. So a treaty becomes domestic law during the ratification process. So it makes it law on the international human rights level, but it's also law in the domestic level through the process of ratification. Um, so if a state only signs it but doesn't ratify it, then the, the government only has an obligation not to... 
undermine the purpose of the treaty. So only the most important obligations. And of course, if they ratify it, then the full treaty uh, becomes law, also in domestic law. And sometimes there's treaties inside of treaties. We'll talk a little more about that with um, the next week when we talk about the different... Um, uh, the ICCPR and ICESCR have reporting protocols. So this is like a little treaty inside of a treaty. It's a, it's another treaty, but only members of this bigger treaty can pass the inside treaty. And that's called a protocol. We'll talk more about those. I mentioned customary international law. This is laws that are not written down on a piece of paper, but they're still laws as if they were in a treaty. And so you need two things to make customary international law. One is uh general practice so that means most states agree they practice this as if it were law and then two they recognize it as law they do this practice as a legal obligation so things like the you know slavery torture no genocide right to life even if they weren't in a treaty they would still be legal obligations because every state agrees these need to be legal obligations that's called customary international law now, there's a special category of customary international law called yes cogens. We'll talk about more of them in the ICCPR class, but yes cogens is a category where you can never restrict this, uh, this law. So again, those ones I mentioned like slavery, torture, um, you know, genocide, uh, you can never restrict those rights. You always have to follow them. Whereas certain rights you can restrict, like the right to speech, the free, uh, you know, right to speech, right to freedom of expression, uh, you can sometimes restrict people's speeches. You can sometimes take videos down that advocate, you know, that tell you how to make a bomb or advocate killing. You can take those videos down and that's not a freedom of expression violation because you can restrict those. But there's some, there's some rights you can never restrict. Those are called yes cogens rights. And then soft law sources, there's lots of documents, basically any legal document that's not a treaty, any document of standards, human rights standards that's not a treaty or customary international law can be soft law. So that's declarations and principles. Um, again, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is technically a declaration. It's not soft law because those rules are also considered customary international law. But another declaration is uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, DRIPS. So this one would be considered a soft law source. It's not a treaty. Uh, they haven't hardened into hard law yet, its rules, um, and we'll talk more about that in that class for Indigenous rights. But uh, so the and another category is um, UN guidelines. So the United Nations bodies write authoritative reports, all kinds of reports and give mandates and standards. Um, so these are UN experts on a human rights issue. They're very influential in their field. Um, so they can, their standards can be considered soft law. Sometimes they're hard law, but they're not, if they're hard law, they're not hard law because they're a uh, declaration or because they're one of these UN documents. They're hard law because they're established in the, in customary international law or a treaty source. But treaties can also be repeated. The rules can be in, repeated in these kind of soft law documents too. So these guidelines and mandates and reports and declarations can be a mix of hard law and soft law. Um, and then treaty bodies. Every treaty that we mentioned also has an administrative body. They can give out reports too, and uh, their reports can be considered soft law. Uh, well, that's another debate we'll talk about. All right, and then the final, I think, two more quick slides. So one is substantive. Now I'm on page 10 of uh, the slides, uh, substantive versus procedural rights. So uh, substantive rights just means the right is for the end result. So freedom of expression means uh, you don't, you know, the, the content of it is you don't stop people from speaking. So that makes it a substantive right is people can speak. Uh, this is contrasted from a procedural right. So a procedural right is not for the end result, but for the method to get you to the end result. So for an example is, um, you know, like uh, maybe right to information. So, uh, or right to participation. Uh, people can be involved in participating for certain, uh, for certain important uh, decisions. Affected people need to be a part of, you know, need to be consulted with before you make the decision. This is called the right to participation. And then a re access to justice. So a person can, if they have a violation, they can go to a court and free trial rights. So these are considered procedural rights because it doesn't tell you how the court will decide. It just decides 
the court process has to be fair or you need to be able to go to court or you need to be able to get information on this issue. So the end result, you might still be found guilty by the court, but if the process was fair, then your procedural rights have been uh, met. So that's procedural rights. So substantive rights means the end results needs to be protected. And procedural rights means the process to get you to the end result needs to be fair. But the end result may go either way. And then let's look at the last slide. This will be the final thing for today. And that's remedies. So like I said, if there's a violation, there can be uh, some victim needs a remedy and there can be different kinds of remedies. And there are two basic kinds of judicial remedies and non-judicial remedies. That means if you go through a court or not, the kinds of things that a court can, um, the kind of remedies a court can give. Uh, so the basic rule for a remedy is it must be effective. So um, if a person suffers a serious human rights violation, your, the remedy cannot just be an apology by itself, or it can't be like $1 because that's not an effective remedy. The remedy has to be effective to uh, showing that this is a serious violation. It needs to seriously punish the person that uh, committed the violation, and for the victim that received it, it needs to be effective to actually help their situation. So an easy example of cessation, uh, the order to stop the violation. So an effective remedy has to stop the violation, or if the violation continues, it's not effective. Uh, an, a, a common remedy is compensation, so some amount of money that's sufficient to restore the person before the violation happened, and maybe something like rehabilitation. So if the person's been injured, like medical treatment or some rehabilitation to get the victim back into um, society or to restore them. Uh, there can also be non-judicial remedies, uh, preventive measures, so the state should take measures to prevent this violation from happening in the future. Um, there can be research to study the problem, impact assessments, and human rights institutions may take certain action. So that's remedies. And uh, that's everything for this class. Uh, so next week we're going to talk about the UN human rights system. and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to put up, uh, you can respond directly in the discussion uh, topic that I brought up in the Hopi page. So ask any questions there and I'll be happy to answer anytime this week and see you next week. Thanks everybody.